This is going to be Psalm chapter 24. And we're going to talk about the real mighty man. You know, the Bible talks about mighty men. It talks about David's mighty men. It talks about the mighty men in Genesis 6. But who is the real mighty man? That would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this chapter, it's heavy on the second coming and the millennial kingdom because it talks about the king of kings that's going to be reigning during the millennium. And in Psalm 24, 8, it says, Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And you know, in Exodus, it says, The Lord is a man of war. You know, he is a man of war. He is mighty in battle. Jesus Christ is called the man Christ Jesus. All God and all man. The Bible speaks of mighty men. But here, Jesus Christ bullies the mighty men. At his second coming. As you read about in Revelation 6.15. That it's these mighty men that will hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. So Jesus Christ is far superior, superior to man. Because of number one, his mighty power. In Psalm 24, 1 and 2. It says the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Jesus Christ is far superior to any man, to any genius, to any tough guy that you see today. His mind is far superior to somebody like Elon Musk or his uh, strength far superior to somebody like Floyd Mayweather or Conor McGregor or Eddie Hall. Or that Devin Lorette guy, the, the arm wrestling champion. He's far superior. And he is creator. In Colossians 1, 15 through 18, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is before all things, and by him all things consist, and all things were created by him and for him. And in Revelation, it said that we were created for his pleasure. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and all that dwell therein. Do you want to go to war with the one who made the sun and made the stars also? Do you want to go into a sword fight with the one who set the earth on its pillars? As it says in 1 Samuel 2, 8, For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. So the earth is the Lord's. You have heard that uh, song called This is a Man's World. That old song, well, it's really the God-man's world. It's God's world. He made it. He died for the sins of it, and he's... He's going to reign on it. And all that dwell therein are his. And you hear people say, I'm my own person. Not so. Especially not if you're saved. Because Jesus bought you with the price. According to 1 Corinthians six nineteen. If you're saved, you've been redeemed. He bought you. And you've heard someone say, This is your world. I'm just living in it. But that's only true if you're saying it to Jesus Christ. And you say, Well, I thought the devil was the God of this world. Yes, but that is only true because God delegated power to him. The Lord is responsible for the authority and leadership and dominion over all things. And in Daniel 2.21 it says, And he changeth the times and the seasons, he removeth kings and setteth up kings. He's the one in charge of that. In Psalm 24.2 it says, For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. So when you're on the beach and those waves are about to knock you over, you need to remember who put that water there and who can lift that water up like he did for Moses and Joshua and Elijah and Elisha. In Genesis 1.10 it says, And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. Who do you think put that water there? And this is the same God that brought two floods, one in between Genesis one one through two and the other in genesis six through nine the same god that will cause the earth to swallow the flood out of the dragon's mouth is the same god that you would be going to war against if you're there at the second coming on the wrong side 
but he hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the Lord is mighty in battle because of his mighty power and because he is a mighty Savior. He's a mighty man because he's a mighty Savior. He's far superior to man because man cannot save you. In Psalm 24, 3, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Since the context has to do with him being king and possessor of earth, I believe this hill of the Lord is where he's probably sitting on earth in Jerusalem during the millennium. And how one will get to ascend into the hill of the Lord. How will one get to ascend there? Well, it says in the next verse, and it says in verse 4, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The only way for me and you to be pure and clean with a righteous soul is to believe on Jesus Christ. He is the mighty Savior. That is the only way we can get the righteousness of God. The Lord is mighty in battle, and on the cross he became sin for us and fought the bulls of Bashan, as it says in Psalm 22. He is the one who made it possible for me and you to be placed into his body. But men in the tribulation will have to have clean hands also to go into the holy hill. And if they get the mark in their right hand, then when Jesus Christ comes back, they go into the fire instead of into the kingdom. They're not going to have clean hands if they do that. But if you're a born-again Christian, then you're already clean. The blood of Jesus Christ made you without blemish and without spot. And that is when it comes to your salvation. When it comes to your daily walk in this life, you need a daily cleansing. And this comes through a daily cleansing of the Word. John 15, 3 says, Now ye are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Uh, when I did a nightly cleanup at the ice cream plant that I work for, I would take the hose that had chemical cleaner, I would turn it on and just let it run and just leave it. And it would go through all those trouble areas. And that got got rid of the gunk and all the junk that I needed to get clean. And that's what the Word does for you. Just park there in it and just let it run through you. In Psalm 24, 4, it says, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So the devil can see God today, and he isn't pure in heart. And me and you are pure in heart in Christ, but there must be a day when Matthew 5, 8 is applied completely literal, and that would be in the millennium during that time the devil is put in the bottomless pit and can't see God. And during that time the unclean spirits pass out of the land and they can't see God. They won't be able to see Jesus on the throne. But those nations that come to worship the king at Jerusalem will have to make sure they are pure in heart when they go up. And they will see the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against the Lord on their way back and forth according to Isaiah 66. When they go up to worship the king... They will see the carcasses burning in a lake of fire on earth during that time. Now, you talk about a deterrent to crime. And if you've never heard of that, look at Isaiah 66, 23 through 24. Just because you never heard it doesn't mean it's not so. That's how you learn. When you hear somebody say something you never heard, you don't say, well, that's not true because I never heard it. You think you've heard everything. That's the problem. In Psalm 24, 5, it says, He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So the Lord is mighty in battle because he is a mighty Savior. He had me and you relying on him, and he came through. He is a real mighty man and a mighty king. That's the last thing we'll talk about. He's a mighty king. Psalm 24, 6, This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. The word seal, I put you in a second advent context in the Psalms. God is the God of gods. He is the God that allowed your false God to be in existence. While the false gods of Hollywood would never have time for you or to desire for you to seek them, the God of gods wants you to seek him. He wants you to seek his face. And it says in Psalm 24, 7, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. I don't think this is just any regular doors. This is everlasting doors. 
Now, this could be referring, I mean, I'm just speculating here. This could be referring, though, to when Jesus Christ would go up to the third heaven to sit on the right hand uh, of the Father after the first coming, after he's died on the cross for our sins, buried and resurrected, got the blood applied, sits down on the right hand of God, and those everlasting doors opened. And there are a lot of kings in God's game of thrones, but now we're talking about the king of glory. Revelation 19.16 says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. 1 Timothy 6.15 says, He is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. So Psalm 24, 7 and 8. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. The Lord is strong. That's why Ephesians six ten says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. The Lord is mighty in battle. Physical battle and spiritual battle. He is almighty. But now it repeats itself in the next two verses. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. In verses 7 and 8, like I said, it could, could be referring to Jesus Christ going to the third heaven after his finished work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. And when he sat down on the right hand of the Father, and then 9.10 could refer to the Lord going back to the third heaven after he's gathered the saints in the rapture. And then, of course, he will come down once again with us to set up his kingdom on earth as king of kings. And it ends with Selah, putting it in that very context of the second coming.